drawing here. Um, Janet Carl is uh, detained in other activities this morning, and so uh, I've been deputized to substitute for her and make the introductions, which I am really delighted to be able to do, is introduce Keisha Scott to you. Uh, she's got a couple of big areas that she works with in the college, the sociology department, and then American studies, and for, you know, we, we throw that term around, but uh, it's an interdisciplinary study that brings together things like sociology, anthropology, history, uh, the arts, English, and so on, in uh, looking at our American culture and civilization. And she's been a mainstay of that program. She arrived at Grinnell in 1986, and I'm going to take a point of personal privilege here. That was when I was president. <laughs> <laughs> and we were working, I'll look at Joe here, and the terrific job that we've done in the last, oh, I'd say 10, 15 years in bringing persons of color to the college. It's now at the point on the campus when you walk around, you no longer say, oh, there's a black student, or there's an Hispanic student, there's an Asian student. It is a culture and a place that reflects the diversity of our society, and it's a great accomplishment for the college, because believe me, we were trying hard in the 1980s, and we weren't succeeding to anything like the degree that the college has now. Kaysho came in 1986. She was virtually the only African-American faculty member. She's a hero. As you can imagine, we had you know, 50, 60, 70 African-American students. And you know that. You, you want someone who looks like you, has experienced what you've experienced, that you can trust to be a mentor. And she was that for those students. And she did that by herself for a long, long time. She's now got quite a bit of help. But uh, I, I really so appreciate what she did in those tough, tough years. As just, you can just imagine the amount of time she spent with those students. So anyway, here's Keisho now. She's uh, drawing toward the end of her career at the college, looking forward to working in community service in various ways. She does workshops all over the nation on racism. Uh, I'm going to take another point of personal privilege. Uh, I was persuaded to do the Women's March in Des Moines in, in 2016. She was the speaker at that event. She roused that crowd. Now, that, that's not like coming in here and giving a more academic talk. You have to be someone who can rouse the crowd, and she certainly did that. So it's a great, great privilege to introduce Kay Show, and she's going to give three lectures on the Black Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? So that was my president, so give him an applause one more time. So um, I need some help, um, which I have, because somehow now I've reached a point where I can't click and talk at the same time. So I've got that help that I need. I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of the uh, Bucket List series. And the Black Holocaust is an extremely emotionally heavy, hands up, come on, see, you're not ready, you're not ready. So that, I did that on purpose, get your hands back up. The point is, is that I don't, you don't need to write anything because I have an outline for you, got it? Please move your coffee, I'll give you my PowerPoint, I don't mind. I want you to have the experience, hands up. Okay, I said it is a heavy experience. It's heavy, just to talk about it. You got that? I just want you to have that sense. We're laughing, but you're laughing because I'm asking you to do something silly. But the point is, it is a very heavy, emotionally subject, and it's um, and the exploration of it will have you thinking in this. Hopefully, in this three-part series, this talk is not about finger pointing. Point your finger out. Come on. It's not about blaming anybody. I'm not interested in that. It is absolutely not about assigning guilt. I'm not assigning guilt to anybody, right? It's not about that. Um, but it is really about exploring the dynamics of what it meant to enslave Africans who became slaves in the Americas and throughout the world. And who were the individuals and who were the nations who were part of that and who benefited of the trafficking? Come on, hands out. Every time I say trafficking, I want to see you do that, because that's what it is. It's trafficking human beings, right? 
It's trafficking. We say slavery. That's the institution they lived in. Before that, put your hands back up. They had to be captured, trafficked, enslaved, right, and freed. You understand that? So what we're going to do is unpackage all of those dynamics. It's really important to do so. And because I'm someone who deals with experiential learning, I'm going to give you some pictures. I'm going to tell this story through pictures. I'll be going faster and slower. Experiential learning and pop quizzes. And I ask you to participate at the level that you're comfortable. I want to tell you a story about the institution of enslavement, slavery, slave labor exploitation, and the impacts on Africa 400 years ago and today. Right? That would be part three. So participate at the level of your ability and comfort. And know that my knowledge is absolutely not as, a, as much as who's in this room. Your experience counts too. My job is just to fill and facilitate this conversation to the best that I can. So please contribute what you know. There will be a point at which hopefully we'll ask questions and we'll do that at a specific time. And finally, I'm not going to spend a second citing any of my sources. My goal is for you to experience, feel, and be informed from a multitude of scholars, activists, organizational leaders, websites on slavery data, political and cultural opinions, op-eds, state, uh, state leaders, in order for you to have a more informed um, experience. So absolutely, I will not be saying what scholar said what. Because first of all, it's too many of them, right? And what I tried to do is distill this information together in a way that would tell a story of pictures. We got that? Hands up. <laughs> Heavy subject. We do it with our heart. Got that? So feel my heart in advance, right? Thank you. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Black Holocaust? Raise your hand. A few of you. All right, let me go back. How many of you have heard of the word Holocaust? Oh, isn't that interesting? Now, once again, how many of you have heard about the Black Holocaust? So I want you to turn to the person next to you for literally no more than about 30 seconds and, and say why you think that is that you haven't heard about the Black Holocaust, right? Just share. Go, pick a diet partner. Don't get embarrassed, just do it, all right? It is, you may not have ever heard of it before. You heard the word Holocaust, but you've never heard of the Black Holocaust. Yes? I've never thought of it in those terms before. Yes. Uh, so you know about slavery. When I look at yeah. what has happened historically, the Holocaust fits it perfectly. Got but it. I've never thought of it in that term. How many people would, would feel that's pretty much their thought too? Thank you. See what I mean? The knowledge in the room is greater. Huh? Okay, anybody else have a different reason that you could assess that I just don't know, right? Here's what, yes. I've never had a teacher mention it. You said my point. Yes. How many people just, it never was taught, right? So one, keep your hand up. So one, because I want you all to see, we weren't taught it, right? And you can't have, a, in many ways, an informed conversation if you weren't taught. You don't know, right? In my experience of being a diversity trainer, people want to have different ideas. They just don't want to be beat the hell up, excuse my language, for what they don't know. You understand? So most of us don't know about the Black Holocaust because we weren't taught about the Black Holocaust, right? So part of my function today is to frame that for you in these three sessions so that you walk away more informed and you can see how this experience of people on the African continent had a worldwide impact. That's my goal for you. All right, my next slide has to do with, I visited, nope. <laughs> All right, so, yes, 
So I want to begin with two, um, two years. 1974, when I was 20 years old, and I visited the Almina Castle, or dungeon in Ghana, with my husband on a first date. There's a dude over there. Uh, he had the smart idea of taking me on a date to see the slave castle, which was built 537 years ago, as of 2019. And he wanted to impress me, and as a matter of fact, he did. I visited the Elmina C Castle again in 2019 as part of the Year of Return program, the commemoration of those people of African descent who came from those slave castles. I am a descendant of someone who came from that slave castle 400 years ago, from 1619 to 2019. My ancestor was brought to the New World. That's what I know. So if that was not the experience of your ancestor, you wouldn't have to know that. Right? Okay? And by the way, let me put my hand up. I wasn't taught it either. <laughs> right? So who was in charge of the education system that I wasn't taught this information either? Right? Next slide, please. The first Africans to the land, uh, to the first Africans to come to, to land, landed in Jamestown, Virginia, was a, which was a British colony uh, in, six, in 1619 were recorded as 20 and odd Negroes. They originated from Angola. Raise your hand if you know where Angola is. Very good. All right, they originated from Angola. These slaves were stolen from a Portuguese slave ship, then transported to an English warship, flying a Dutch flag, so obviously they were incognito, and they were eventually sold to the colonial settlers. So many of us who have some sense of history or, or have studied some element of Black History Month will probably retell that story. They know a little bit. I mean, later you'll find out that the first Isabella and William were the first slaves um, in enslaved population. They had the first child, William, in 1624. And you'll hear those parts of that story. But I'm not going that far. I just want you to have a sense. So I want you to repeat out, out loud, then, next slide, what then I think our goal is. Our goal is, number one, to, to look at the places and spaces. Say that. Places and spaces. The human cargo. Human cargo. Next slide. The power relations. Power relations. And the global participation. Global participation. Four fingers. What I hope in this first session is to give you some sense of those dynamics. And as my president said, this is an interdisciplinary perspective, right? It draws from history, material culture, anthropology, and on and on and on, economics and blah, blah, blah. So the point is, is for you to see the interconnection of those kinds of things. Next slide. In order to more efficiently do that, I think we have to do timelines. See, here's the deal. When the hand, hands out, when the writers of history, who writes history, by the way? Yeah. Okay, I love this. You can say white men, but really the victors. Doesn't matter who they are, right? And in many ways, they wrote history in a blurred kind of way. So I want to unblur the history so you'll have a sense of what I'm talking about. Got that? I don't want to beat up anybody. What I want to do is give some historical ac ac accuracy. So the timeline that is important is that between 1400 and 1600, it was European exploration. Hands up, eyeballs. For whatever the reason Europeans were looking all over the world, I think they had some dumbass idea, excuse my language, called the world was flat and they were interrogating that. You understand? Right? Whatever it was, I don't care what it is, that this period was dominated by exploration. That's not meanness. You understand? That's not that they were bad. And they were not the only human beings to be exploring all over the world. That is a human phenomenon, to want to see how other people are in other parts of the world, right? So I want to make a distinction. The next part of the timeline is between 1600 and about 1750, where we are, hands out, trafficking. Now they have decided that, the, what, that what they're trading, the most valuable part of that trade is the human cargo. So we're going to make a distinction and look at what was the process in which you enslaved. By the way, how many people have ever called the police and got somebody arrested? I've done that. Oh my goodness, am I the only one? All right. And the police come and they arrest the person and they contain them, isn't that right? And then there's a due process. Well, what I am saying is that there was a period in which enslavement was the dominant notion. 
And we're going to look at what that is in the second session. How were people enslaved? You have the Cato Prince structure to do that. It isn't fly by night, right? And the third part, and this is where people get confused, because colonization didn't necessarily take place before exploration. And that is between 1750 and 1865, we have colonization. Europeans are colonizing parts of the world. You got that? All right, everybody stand up. If you can, and to your comfort, quickly turn to a partner. And how? Did, what did you learn from seeing this timeline? Talk. Go for it. How did this help you understand something? Talk with your partner. You can also sit. You don't have to stand. Anybody? I'm going to start calling on you because that's how I do to my students, cold party, huh? Anybody want to share what you said? I heard you talking. <laughs> Somebody? Yes. Uh, well, I was looking at the timeline in terms of what happened to the Philippines. I'm from the Philippines. Yes. And Ferdinand Magellan came to the Philippines in 1521. Yes. And he was the first person to circumnavigate the world because, as you said earlier, they From a European point of view. Yes. Yeah. But that's, Spain, actually, that's not true. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, Spain. what I'm saying, if you have a society that's been, you know, 3,000 years old, or a society that's 12,000 years old, we don't know their history, right? But from a European point of view, you're absolutely right. That's the stakeholder, right? That we would say from that point of view. Right? Absolutely. So my point is, is that I want to use these <coughs> distinctions as a way to help my presentation. The bottom line is something that most people don't know, is that 17, 700 years before 1400, Arab Muslims, with the rise of Islam, uh, uh, made a connection between the east, put your hands over here, the east part of the continent, all right, to the north part of the continent, right? And in making that, they captured also slaves. And they began the slave movement 700 years before Europeans, come on, hands up, were even looking. You understand what I'm saying? We're even looking, right? So I want to make a distinction between different routes in slavery and why we talk often about the transatlantic route and we don't talk about the other routes of slavery and why that's important. Um, what did enslavement mean in the Middle East and why? How did they use agricultural workers, teachers, harem guards, and by the way, what's really interesting is that a lot of uh, their records demonstrate now that they captured uh, slaves to, uh, to castrate them and make them, made them harem guards. And another piece of just trivia is that uh, when um, Oprah Winfrey did her um, roots, her ancestors were from Angola. So most of us think of most of the slaves as coming from West Africa. I'm going to show you that they came from different parts. There were more than one route. Um, at this time, if you were a Muslim, right, or you converted to Islam, you could be in, if, if you were a Muslim and converted to Islam, you could not be enslaved. In fact, if you were a non-Muslim or you were lost in war, you had no guarantee not to be enslaved, right? So this happened how many years before the Europeans were exploring? 700 years, right? So when we tell, hands out, a global story, 
This idea that globalization did not happen last week. You understand what I mean? That there has always been this experience of globalization. Hold your question. I'll come to it. All right? All right, next slide. I want to get to the routes. There were three African slave trade routes. Next slide. The first one was called the Trans um, <clears throat> the first one was called the Trans-Saharan Slave Route. This route was one in which was mostly traded gold, salt, cola nuts, cowrie shells, horses, and camels. This was the trade route from hands up the north to the west. As I said, imagine in your mind Africa. Okay. Um, this was uh, within the larger hands out Trans-Saharan slave trade, right? So there was a larger um, Saharan slave trade, which was part of more parts of Africa, and later we'll see in the Middle East. This happened from the 7th through the 14th century. How many centuries is that? Seven. Ten centuries, right? So when we tell the story of enslaved Africans, we have to tell the full story. I want to say that slavery started, uh, they estimate now that African historians are writing history too, right? They are excavating their own stories. Um, the majority of African studies professors in this country are white, male, so Africans are still not writing their own stories. But of those that are, they're beginning to excavate a story about 10 centuries of enslavement. They have identified that slavery started in Egypt when the Egyptian king was converted to Islam in the 17th, 7th century. The king, was, uh, the king of Muslim Egypt took Sudanese slaves as part of their tribute annually, right? So if you're taking 15 or 20,000 slaves, what are you doing with it? That would have been gold, right? At that historical time. The Trans-Saharan slave route probably ended up in, hands up, going further north to Saudi Arabia, probably the Arab world and all of its great tentacles, right? So if you look um, at the phenotype of many countries and Arab countries, you'll see that they have a color cast. You got that? They're lighter and they're variations of darker, right? All right, but some slaves were part of the route, but not all of them were indentured from war, poverty and abandonment were also reasons they were enslaved. Number two, please change. Change. Yes. <laughs> the second route, all right, was the transatlantic slave route. Hands up. That's what we learned in school. Got that? Yeah. Open the book. That's what we saw in the book and we learned, right? Okay, good. Um, we call it the what? Middle what? Passage. Passage, right. It was from West Africa to the New World to Europe. That was the route. It was from 1600 to 18, uh, 1600 to 1800, two centuries. The captures were from central, put your hands, imagine your African map, the center, the east, and the west of Africa, where people were hands out, trafficked, put in slave castles, and brought over in ships. That's the model we know, right? Okay, remember, Many African countries were not named and partitioned by Europeans until the Berlin Conference in 1884. So we don't actually have names of where they came from, right? Which is why DNA is so significant, right? Because we can know the peoples, but we don't know necessarily the countries because Europeans didn't get together until 1884 to decide how they were going to manage their colonization of most of the world, right? And, and therefore, in partitioning, they gave various names. So Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. You understand that, right? Okay, good. So Africans had their own names for their own kingdoms and their own divisions. This is what most of us know, all right? Okay, the third route, please. The third route is the one that I am learning the most I can about, and that is the Trans-Indian Ocean Route. This route is a route that predominantly traded ivory, cloves, and later human cargo. They brought slaves from the inland people, inland peoples of Central Africa, the Congo, Sudan, and Angola, and already said um, Oprah Winfrey's ancestors were from Angola, where the, African, where the African hub was Cape Coast, Ghana, and Gore Island in Senegal. The east coast part of the African hub was in Zanzibar, which is now Tanzania. 
And this is where you heard about pirates and slave ships and taking over and all these fights. This happened in that island of Zanzibar, which was owned, by the way, by an Arab uh, leader. It wasn't owned by any European. One of this predominated from the 15th through the 19th century. Most of the enslaved populations went to Morocco and Egypt. And um, so I want you to turn to somebody in a dyad way quickly, because I'm going to be sparse about my time. How did learning about these three routes inform what you now recognize about hands out? Trafficking, right? What's your aha about learning this? Pick a person and talk. Go for it. Next slide. about the three routes of slavery. Thank you. How, what did that inform you? What did that get you to, you know, I do this in my class. <laughs> Imagination, right? <laughs> Makes you think different, right? Yes. Well, it informed me that slavery was pervasive through time and through geography and through religions. I mean, Absolutely. you know, the, the um, Muslim religion, um, you know, and, and, and in fact, where the slaves were treated as a commodity, like gold and salt and so on. Right. Good. Thank you. Someone else? Yes. Uh, I, it's always seemed strange to me how I see dark people in places that it doesn't seem like they ought to be there, like in the Middle East or in, in Spain. Right. And their darkness, we're not always sure what's associated with. Yeah. By the way, do you have, has anybody ever made this era? You go, uh, have, have uh, either seen uh, films or pictures in India, and then you assume, well, they have racism too. <laughs> and you don't, you're, you're, what are you doing? Hands up. You're imposing your cultural ideas on another society, right? You're measuring them by your own standards. That doesn't fit, right? So when, Although they have color cast, it serves a very different purpose. So you're absolutely right. Okay, so what's important to me about sharing those three routes is that the one that's most um, excavated in terms of scholarly study is obviously the, the second one, right? And now we're beginning to see what is the impact as more people of color around the world begin to study their internal histories about their connection with the slave. And that's going to, hand, hands over here, that's going to turn the wheel of the way all of us understand, you know, enslavement, slavery, right? And later, resistance on the part of many of those people to be in those institutions, right? So we've had sort of a, a, a limited picture. My hope is as more scholarship emerges, that there will, we will be able to um, have a bigger picture. You had a question. Now I can take it. <laughs> Sorry, I hope it didn't. Yeah, uh, I, uh, or comments. You're saying that uh, 700 years ago was about the origin of slavery, but I think uh, from reading the, the, the origin Bible, of slavery that's connected to the ones I'm modeling, 
right? Or, uh, reading the Bible and I read yeah. um, uh, about ancient Rome, uh, certainly <coughs> slavery was rampant in those cultures, yes. uh, including the biblical one. Right. I've got a lot of that uh, involved Africans. Absolutely. I think I remember when I was a kid seeing Spartacus. Anybody saw that movie? Yeah. Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> right? And one of the gladiators was a, a tall African looking person. And they had a reason to be in unity because they were gladiators, right? So, so let me just make a distinction. Thank you for that question. Slavery has always been in the human experience, right? But what we're trying to understand is what is the nature of some of those, that slavery, right? As an institution. And certainly, I'm following, put your hands over here, I'm following that thread, now pull the thread, that as part of the European and then the American experience, right? Because we're descendants of, Brit of a British colony. Got that? So that's the one, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there has been slavery throughout the human history, and that slavery has been, in some il il elements, humane, and some very inhumane experiences, right? All right. Um, Next slide, and I, you're going to give me my time whenever you're ready. So it's important to list the continents that were involved. What became later the part of the United States only received about 5% of the slaves brought from Africa. What percent did I say? Five. Okay, so we have this idea that they were like coming over in the millions. That's not actually true. Scholars are interrogating those numbers. Now by the time 1865 happened, and there were about four and a half million, or maybe five million across the board, including mixed race children, who were, who were freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. We're only talking about maybe 500,000 slaves coming to, the new, to what we call America. You understand? So off their labor, the infrastructure of America's elements of it, uh, came from that. But what's really important is that we know often what countries and what continents this happened in. Um, uh, Portugal, Netherlands, United Kingdom, France, Kingdom of Italy, Saudi Arabia, Zanzibar, Barbary Coast, which was a British colony in Oman. And then there were the buyers for the plantations, the United States, Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, Jamaica, Barbados. So they came from, so that means that this tells us something about the mode of transportation or an element of how the world was global at that time, right? This idea that, yes, it took a long time for people to move around, but this institution became extremely strong because of the systems that they had in place to move people around before they started, hands out, trafficking people to come. So there were systems where people traded all over the world. When they added human cargo, they added another dimension to the, their trade. Right? By the way, have you ever babysit a ba you know a, a, a one year, a one month old? Anybody? Yeah. An eighteen month old? A three year old? You want you want to just ch you know chain them down? All right. <laughs> a five year old, an eleven year old. At each different level, right? There is a level of responsibility that you have as the person who's responsible. So imagine the trafficking process. Come on, get your hands trafficking. You traffic a 19-year-old strong male, right? How do you then, what do you have to exercise on them in order to control them, right? So obviously, hands up, technology and how to capture and enslave increased, right? In order to move people all over the world. You follow me? So this is why it's important that we know how many continents, just about all of them out of the seven were, in, not all of them, but at least five were involved, right? and the need for agricultural products that slave labor was part of. Next slide, please. Okay. No, can we go back for a moment? Let's go back. Back, one more. So I want to make a distinction between who are the beneficiaries and that was Europe, Asia, which we would have concluded, which would, would have said in our mind was India and the Middle East, and the Americas, both of them, and that's Central America too. And the wealth that was accumulated in terms of that human cargo built this society, built later the Industrial Revolution to happen in other countries where it didn't happen in, in other parts of the world, right? 
So when you accumulate money, you get to invest that money and it, it spurs the development of your society, hands up. So we even use the language developed and civilized and underdeveloped and uncivilized. We use that language, right? But we don't always talk about the process by which that language came into being, right? So I'm challenging you to think about the language that we use relative to this experience. This is what exploration led to enslavement, which led to um, slavery, which created this world. And the losers were the people who lost millions, their most talented, their most esteemed, their strongest, which leaves them like this. And we're talking about slavery, right? Hands over here. We're talking about traffic. We're talking about capture, in trafficking, slavery, right? And freedom, 400 years. So if we want to know about 860 million people that live on the continent of Africa, we want to and, and say why are have they not developed? We have to go back and look at the histories, right? Not just in terms of our strand as people of European descent, but the global dynamic of what was happening to them simultaneously. We're not taking all the responsibility. All right, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And this is gonna be my last point before we stop. Is that okay? We'll take a break. So what was slave labor used for? All right, it was used for everything. <laughs> it was used for everything, everything. So what I want you to do is look at this list and other ideas and think about your own history, where you came from, if you're not from Iowa. Like I'm from Detroit, right? I grew up in Detroit, you know, um, and I think about, um, you know, my father worked in a factory. My mother was a stay-at-home uh, mom um, until my parents divorced, and then she became a nurse. So I grew up with the big three auto industry and, and the political movements of unions and all of those kinds of things. And how Detroit got developed as one of the central places in the United States has to do with, it is also a place where people left Iowa, which was not a slave state, ended up through Chicago, then Detroit, and then in Canada, and through Ontario. So one of the largest museums in the world for free slaves went through a city that I grew up in, right? Okay, and so I want you to think for a minute of where you came from, where you live, what the history of your own family is relative to any of these products, right? And share with somebody how, if you tease back enough those products, how might they have been related to slavery, right? Enslaved labor, right? So I'm gonna give you a few, we're gonna talk, we we'll give you a little bit of diet time around this, then we're gonna take our break, is that okay? So go back to your own personal histories, right? All right, share with the person, please. Pick somebody different, turn around and pick somebody behind you. Was it sugar? Was it salt mines? Did you need, did you need, what did you live near? Right, thank you.
The owner of the land got the got the fruit of the crop and they got the let's go. Just so that you know, you heard historians know better than I do, but it was a surprise to me that my he one of my heroes, um, Abraham Lincoln, when he was a young senator, was on a committee for the um, commission of Liberia to be a place as an alternative place for slaves to return to. It was one of the plans that they were thinking about. If we're going to end this slavery, let's where where are we going to send these people back to? Right. On the other on the other hand is that um, there's now the data that talks about um, how um, the Emancipation Proclamation, the compromise they came up with was that they gave uh, slave owners in the U.S. in particular, what I'm talking about, is that they gave them 20, uh, two years uh, to turn in their, to free their slaves and they would get compensation. And their compensation was one and a half, right? So if they paid uh, $700, they get, one, they get more than what they actually paid for, right? And if you look at the percentage of slave owners who were willing to turn in their slaves, it was no more than 20%. Do you understand? Yep. So slavery was embedded in the history of our country, right? As a way of creating economic means for a group of people whose 800 years of feudalism history gave them no option. You understand? So they came to the New World, later joined America, for the idea of having economic freedom but that economic freedom was dependent on the enslavement of a population, right? Now having said that, what's important is the Emancipation Proclamation was only 155 years ago. Do you know that? It was only 155 years ago, right? So for many of us, if we subtract our age from that, and we subtract our grandparents' age and our great grand I grew up with three generations, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, and my parents. I would love you. We lived within a sh short area, and we told stories. So what I'm interested in, very quickly, and then we have to go take our break, is what do you remember about any of these products or ideas that are directly related to slavery, right? Slave labor, yes. There you go. My mother's ancestors lived in Mississippi and Alabama, so they raised cotton. Right. And that doesn't mean they, they would have directly been part, but I'm saying there is no untouchable place, right? Hands out. It's everywhere, right? Somebody else tell a quick story, then we got to take a break. Anybody else can pick one of these? Yes. So my dad was a member of a union, and my mom was a stay at home mom. Got it. And we were in Chicago. Yes. So, but I'm a generation. I'm older than you, mm -hmm. and so it's not, didn't start with you. It, it was, it's older than that. Absolutely. Yep, I'm 66. All right, somebody else quickly can tell a story? All right, ooh. I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, that's great. My mother is 85, actually. <laughs> She's from uh, um, Pennsylvania. And Anybody else? I am saying to you, if I gave you a homework assignment between now and next time for you to pick one of these and to tease it back, you would find that the state you came from, the city you came from, elements of that were part of this. When I went down to the, to the state legislature, um, legislature and I won a major award on my birthday last year, one of the things that happened is I was, before that award, I was standing in the dome and I was looking up and I was remembering who built that dome. Right? There was not even slavery in Iowa, but who built that dome? In the same way that Michelle Obama made the comment, every day I'm in a house that was built by slaves. Right? So it's not about being mad at that. It's about understanding the tension and contradiction that this institution has created as a, we're not going to talk about American slavery per se, but we're going to talk about the larger enterprise of hands up trafficking people. All right, take your break. Come back on time because I want all my time. So, can you get that bite and hit the next slide? Where's my slide version? Whoa. The next slide. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay, let me get over here. So, one of the other uses <laughs> of um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. 
So one of the other uses of slave labor is the unspoken and secret slave labor. We're going to talk about that mostly in the second section, where I begin to talk about looking at, come on, let's do it again, capture, right? All right? Trafficking, right? Enslaving, right? Transporting, slavery, that's living as a slave, and their resistance. So we're looking at all of those patterns, right? Many times that story has been told from a genderless point of view. So this is the other aspect of what that labor was used for, right? And I'm gonna talk about that, and that's not gonna be as comfortable. I promise you. But these pictures are of illicit sexual and romance between slave owners and slaves, as well as white and the enslaved population. These pictures demonstrate a time in which rape laws did not apply to female slaves. They were owned, and later, African American women. By the way, the first, so that you know this, the first prosecuted white man for raping a black woman didn't happen until 1967 in the United States. I just want you to know that. You start doing the history, we've excavated, and that was, you know, not in the South, that was in Virginia. Just like the famous loving case, where a man loved his wife and had to move out of Virginia and live somewhere else in Washington, D.C., right? And that case went all the way to the Supreme Court, which is about loving who you want to love, right? Because we had miscegenation laws, particularly in the United States, which did not permit white men for marrying their enslaved partner so that their status would change. You got that? That's pretty smart on the part of the owners but not so smart in terms of the losers. So what I wanted to say is that these pictures highlight the intimate relationships between enslaved populations and whites who created mixed race children. These pictures show how the enslaved populations were segregated and divided in labor by color. Repeat that, in labor by color. So your color could determine whether you were a field slave or a house slave, right? And what privileges you had. And if you came from a particular state like New Orleans, where they had the tradition of speaking French, right? Just like people in Maine. By the way, nine million people speak French in the United States, even today is their first language, right? When you go to New Orleans, when they had um, mixed race children and they were sons, they sent them to France. So different states had different ways of relating to the institution of slavery. But again, I'm only giving you examples in our slave experience. I'm going to go back and we want to stick with what happened in Africa. These pictures show how unspoken sex labor also made slave mistresses. In fact, there is now a very famous uh, New York Times uh, story that was written about Thomas Jefferson's mistress. Right? And who was that? Sally who? Emmons. By the way, that was her, that was his wife's sister by his father who enslaved, who had, who had a child with um, uh, an enslaved woman. And if you go to Thomas Jefferson's grave today, you'll see both Sally Hemings on one side and his wife on the other. Right? So we don't know how to interrogate what these relationships meant, but we know this was the other labor that we don't talk about. And finally, scholars are now exploring, this is one of the books I'm reading now, how white, how southern white women's property from birth was protected because they had a lifetime ownership of their slaves. In many slave states, their fathers passed legislation that if their wife went into the marriage with a, child, with a slave or two or 10, they would always remain hers, not marital property. Right? So that gave her an advantage all of the time, right? To not be made poor again. But also it dispelled this myth, a very deep myth, that it was the men who engaged in a lot of the brutality with enslaved population. In many cases it was white women. So the slave narratives tell that, but also now the data is coming out. It was often the mistress who sent that slave 
enslaved person that her husband was sleeping with away. You understand? And the children as punishment, right? So now this is being documented. Now, hands up. Talk about being in a hard place. You understand what I'm saying? We're not beating up these white women. We're looking at the hard place they were in, right? Terribly hard place. Trying to maintain their families, all right? Next slide. So very specifically then, what is a holocaust? And a holocaust is a destruction or slaughter on a mass scale of a people for economic advantage, remo remo removal from their land, subjugation, or humiliation. That's what it's about. It's what a holocaust is about. And while I say some words that have been associated with the Holocaust, I want you to say, wow, right? I just want you to feel this for a moment. Cataclysm, cataclysm. Disaster. Catastrophe. Destruction. Devastation. Um, annihilation. Ravaging, Why? institutional state sanctioned violence, Why? massacre, Why? slaughter, Why? mass murder, Why? carnage, Why? butchery, Why? extermination, Why? liquidation, Why? genocide, Why? ethnic cleansing, <coughs> reduction of the natural order of society. <coughs> What I want you to have a sense of is that the Holocaust is an intentional political and military action <laughs> of a more powerful nation over, or, or peoples over another. It is a strategy. So when we learn, for an example, I just went to um, Poland and, and visited the slave Holocaust sites, which blew my mind. Um, I could barely stand there and see what I was seeing. But one of the things is, that was the final solution of Nazi Germany trying to actually eliminate all the Slavic people. And the intention was to eliminate 100 million Slavs. So when you go to visit Auschwitz, that's the first camp. The second camp had 300 ovens. They were building that at the time. So they experimented with eliminating one ethnic group. They started out by eliminating Polish people who were in resistance. Later Jews that they sent all over the, from all over that part of the world to be eliminated and then began to build larger ovens to kill the rest of the Slavs because they wanted that land. What do you say? Oh, it's very depressing. So my point to you when you visit Holocaust websites is that you find that the Holocaust has, been, has happened throughout history on every continent. It reflects, as I said, differences in military um, and political power of nations. Um, there's an interesting website um, which identifies at least the top 150 atrocities by century. All right, it goes all the way back to um, um, the seventh century and just identifies who were the people who who engaged in the Holocaust behavior and what were the outcomes. Right, and obviously, hands over here, where there is Holocaust behavior, what do people do? They leave. Right. So again, this Holocaust behavior contributed to mold to globalization. Isn't that an irony of that? <laughs> right? It contributed to people leaving and moving all over the world. One of the interesting things that um, uh, when I was on Grinnell in London teaching uh, for the college, I had my students um, interview the German internees. We in turn in this country, our country, the Japanese. But they in turn the Germans. So I had my students interview people who were descendants and to look at how they were treated 
in, in London in particular, because that's where the class, classes we were teaching were cited. And they were able to tell a very different story, right? Many of them had fled Germany because they had anticipated the Holocaust happening and they didn't want to be part of it, right? And students didn't know that. They had no idea. Again, hands out, who is writing history? <laughs> right? The people who want to leave out stories. Next slide, please. So now we come to the heart of the Black Holocaust. The enslaved African men and women and children, they estimated that about 1% were children. Um, they brought children who were somewhere between 9 and 13, right? Were part of the, on those ships that we see here. Um, it was um, one woman to 10 um, uh, men who were brought. Um, they had to be captured first, then forced to march to the hub center, which again would have been in Ghana or would have been in Zanzibar. So that meant that <laughs> their marches were months or even longer than they were in captivity often, which meant that part of the reason, hands up, their price value went up is because how much money did the trafficker had to invest to keep them alive, right? To get them to the hub site. So we're gonna be talking about that, right? All right, so they could live in a castle, which I now call a dungeon, before they were transported to some place in the New World. Um, on the coast, they would be packed into dungeons or forts, often for months to await the ships that would carry them into slavery. So I'm going to be bringing um, a recording that I want you to hear of an event that happened in the Elmina Castle in my uh, visit um, in August. <clears throat> so this is the point in which I want those people who I gave those balls of thread, can you turn the light back on please? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, can you, if you have that ball of thread, can you stand up? Okay, good. Will you tie one end around your waist? Um, Vicki, can I get you to go on this side over here? Sure. All right, good. Tie it around your waist. Very good. You're so willing. <laughs> I'm not going to traffic you, I promise. Thank you. But I want to show you something, right? I want to show you something. Got it? All right. So the rest of you, I want you to be willing to either have this ball, you take this ball, or I want you to throw it to someone because we're going to build a net, all right? And I want you, I don't want anybody to be hurt, I just want you to recognize that we're going to build a net. So you can put it in any direction you want, Sue, right? But I want you to stand, for those who have it around your waist, I want you to stand, all right? Start moving it around. I want you to create a net, all right? Put it, put it around your waist when it comes to you. Excuse me, put it around your waist when it comes to you and then stand. Very good. Oh, he threw it. Good. Put it around your waist when it comes to you. Move it around. Good. So when we want to try to understand how enslaved populations were impacted, we want to understand the network that impacted them. Like what network did they go from being free people in their own kingdoms to being in a network that they couldn't get out of? So I want to duplicate that network, right? Oh, look at this. I love it. Very good. Move it around. You don't have to tie it, but just send the ball. Very good. Send it to the next person. I want you to now try to link up. Try to link it up. Good. Link it up with the next ball. Good. Link it up. Very good. You can put it around your arm if it's easier. If it's easier, put it around your arm. Yeah, don't drag Sue anywhere. Please don't drag Sue anywhere. <laughs> put it around your arm. Right. All right, link it up with this one. Good job. Link it up. Good. Put it around your arm. All right, have you interconnected it yet? Try to interconnect it. All four of them should be interconnected now. Good. Oh, good. Looks dangerous. 
quite get it all the way around. Good try. Good try. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, they're still connected. Great. Put it around your arm. You don't have to put it around your... Yeah, very good. Keep connecting it. Very good. Oh, this is lovely. <laughs> so if you can now put on your imagination, keep finishing. Imagine what it would have been like for an African. Okay? Because that's who they were. They were Africans. Right? They became enslaved people. Then they became slaves. And then they became, later, when slavery was ended, they became the citizens of whatever countries they were in. And then we proceeded to call them then minorities, right? Without addressing how they became minoritized, right? Because guess what? No one is born a minority. You weren't born a minority. You might have been born in ethnicity, but you weren't born a minority. So part of the reason, the thing I want you to see, is that these Africans who had centuries of, of kingdoms, cultures, language, diversity, education, one of the oldest universities in the world was in Timbuktu, right? Where they estimate, they, some people argue that this is where Jesus was supposed to have disappeared for 12 years. Who knows? India. If you look at the other parts of the world that were advanced, right? China. But that's not the point. The point is is that no one is born, no one is born a minority. Just like no one was born a slave. It is a process that you become, right? And there are many different forms of slavery. So what I want you to see is that this process that took you eight minutes to do, took centuries to do, right? And now you're interconnected whether you like it or not, right? I want you to try to, everybody move this way, pull them this way. All right, now try to pull them the other way. Pull them the other way. Now try to move forward. You are linked in and connected. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. But imagine what an enslaved person experienced. Stay there. All right, so I want you to start turning in place as I identify, and you're going to start feeling the tightness of what an enslaved person felt like. They were forced to march. Move a little bit. Just turn a little bit. All right? Stop. I didn't say all the way around. I said a little bit. I have a lot of these. They had to migrate for either safety. Turn a little bit. Oh, you say I'm already tight, Keisho. How many of them had to steal property to survive? Turn some more. How many of them had to leave their families? Turn more. How many of them were physically and psychologically abused? Turn more. Now this is on his neck now. Look at this, right? Their families were broken up. Turn more. They lacked access to education. Turn more. They were assimilated and they lost their own culture. Turn more. They were dehumanized in that process. Turn more. They were tortured and raped. Turn more. They were medically experimented with. Turn more. By the way, five of the top scientists in the American Medical Association created and co-sponsored runaway-itis as a disease for slaves. That money was, was given to them to do that research. And the first lecture that I listened to in college by Dr. Shockley, in this, I went to college in 1969, I think 1970, was about the brain size of women was less than men. So we've invested in this surgery a very long, I mean this, this research for a very long time trying to prove inferiority and superiority. This is not new in the experience. Turn again, the victims of race riots, turn. Lynching, mass murders, turn. And lasting psychological effects. All right, so here's my question to you. What do you notice? You get caught, what else do you notice? It hurts. You can't move. What else do you notice? No control. What else do you notice? Who in the hell is helping you? Get out of this. When the self-interest of other people is to keep you there, enslavement is necessary. That is what I wanted you to get. 
this wasn't about bad people. It was about economic imperative, right, from some people to employ a system at the expense of another people. Please lightly, softly untangle yourself. <laughs> For the rest of you, talk about stand up, get a diet partner. What did you learn from this? What did doing it show you? How do you feel right now? Share with a diet partner. Thank you, George. I'm almost done. Not now. No, I'm gonna hold on. Next slide. Thank you. Can you hit the lights now? Thanks for being willing to wound that back up. Thank you. <laughs> you all are so willing. <laughs> so, I would like to take a moment and just ask a couple of people, what did you, what did you feel doing this? What did you think doing this? Joe, I kept seeing your head go into all kind of, what's going on as you watch this? Uh, the, the piece about self-interest, um, preservation. Yeah. Uh, you might see this, you might object to it, you might not know how in the world you're going to address it because it's almost got power over you after it's embedded. Right. And it looks like the natural order of things, right? Okay. Anybody else? Thoughts? I know some of you, so don't let me call your names. <laughs> yes. Thoughts? The more I, I got wound, uh, the more helpless I felt, and I started to feel fear, you know, about, I didn't know this person next mm -hmm. to me, and mm -hmm. I had no choice, mm -hmm. they, just being, you know, was not a comfortable feeling. Absolutely. Someone else, please. <clears throat> yes, George. It seems to me that this also demonstrates why this is such a persistent issue, the legacy of slavery in our, in our nation. Um, so that African Americans, because that's where they began, have a different status within our society as a result of that legacy. Right. And you can see this with the winding up that we just went through. And it almost is a duplication of that slide in which the beneficiaries live like this and the losers live like that. So you see the disparities in communities and you can, pop, you can populate and use a theory that you must have done this to yourself, but no one is born a minority. People are minoritized, right? Okay, by processes like this, right? So be mindful when you use that word next time. Be prepared to talk about how that person got that way, or you have minoritized them, right? You have made them something they weren't born, right? Through your eyes. That's why you had this gray color, depressing, <laughs> yes. this dirty. Yes. I got it from Walmart, yes, on sale. <laughs> Absolutely, Sue. So let me, can we move on? Just. Hold, stay with that feeling, right? Again, this isn't about making anybody feel bad. It's just about awakening ways of thinking, right? And each session will have those powerful moments. I was hoping this would be one. Scholars say that the transatlantic slave trade, the Middle Passage, involved anywhere between 12 to 15 million slaves that were brought to the New World. And that meant they also estimate now, scholars between the global north and south are navigating and negotiating, that about 20% of them never survived. They just never survived that voyage, period. This is only one route. <coughs> this is one route. What they estimate now, as we have global south scholars, people writing from countries that were once colonized, is that 
They are arguing that the Trans-Indian Oceans trade route involved 100 million enslaved Africans over 10 centuries. So the depopulization that we'll be talking about in the third session, if we took out half of Cynthia's family, what would happen, right? If we took out 80% of your family, what would happen, all right? So we're gonna be looking at the impact of, because we know that slavery took, uh, enslavement, capture and enslavement took place in different parts of Africa, in the continent. We're gonna be looking at the impact that that actually had then and the implications for it now. The challenge of data numbers, and this data is a very good way to tell a story, but it's inaccurate. It becomes, it's not the fuller picture. But data numbers, one reason it's a challenge is because capturing the enslaved populations, we're not sure what was the origin of their death, what illnesses that they already have, what caused their death. Um, we don't know. Right? Were they killed on the spot? They certainly were cargo. If they held up other cargo, they could be shot and killed. Right? Yes? I heard someplace that the sharks changed their paths across the ocean following slave ships. Absolutely. Um, um, Van Sertema, who taught at Rutgers University Press, who talked about Africans in the New World, looked at oceanography and animals uh, in the sea and made those same connections, absolutely. And as we learn more, and we're doing, come on, hands out, interdisciplinary study, not just disciplinary studies, but we're linking these disciplines together, we're gonna find more evidence that supports that kind of information. Um, the challenge of using data numbers is because enslaved populations were on multiple routes at various times. So we're telling the story of one route. We don't know about the other route. Not route, I mean route, right? We're just now learning about other routes. And we want to see how those intersected what information. It's because enslaved populations were also assimilated by religion. <coughs> Dorothy's point, right? Right? Assimilated by religion. And, and it was the local religion, it was Islam, but it also would have been Christianity, right? And now, what's interesting is that scholars in countries that are Buddhist are looking at um, how Buddhism was also spreading in different parts of the world and, and people chose Buddhism, right? By the way, I'm doing a study with my husband and we're looking at nine, uh, the first country um, to, one of the first countries to become Christian uh, after the birth of Christ was Ethiopia. Most Americans don't know that. And, um, but Ethiopia was um, populated by nine Syrian saints who built uh, cathedrals to Jesus, right, and Christianity. So the conversion was more than just one religion, right? So we're going to be look. So one of the reasons it's hard to figure out the data, all right, about enslaved populations is because when they were converted to those religions, they were no longer seen as enslaved populations. Right? And finally, because enslaved populations did not at all measure mixed race children. <clears throat> because enslaved population records were not kept in cultures where statistics were not perceived as being valuable. So it's really interesting that we can look at Thomas Jefferson's records of his slave and how much food and all those kind of things. But their other cultures did not use that level of uh, attentiveness with regard to their populations. So we don't have the data. We have oral stories that tell us, but we don't, we don't have uh, the other. So what I'd like you to do is I want you to, um, what's my time? Okay, 16 after. Next slide. So I want to, I want to believe that there are certain lessons that can be drawn by using the Holocaust trope to look at the Black Holocaust. I mean, often we will look at, um, with slavery and we'll say, well this one was worse or better, <laughs> right? Um, or we'll, um, uh, we'll say, um, well, uh, slaves here got treated better because 
um, in 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 uh, North Car or less in North Carolina, South Carolina, than they did in in uh, in Canada or not in Canada, but in uh, Louisiana, because they believed in miscegenation, right? Or uh, where miscegen laws were actually absolutely pressed and where they were not used at all, right? They were more laxed. I think I wanted to leave you with kind of what I think the lessons can be and, and, and to prepare you for the second um, talk, which is more intense about what the material culture that's left over is telling us about enslavement of Africans. So in conclusion, I believe that the Holocaust literature and methodologies of studies offers us a real important story. It tells us about enslaved populations in their way of creating wealth for the rest of the world. Let's remember, they were a source of unpaid labor. Let's remember that. That whatever they produced, they were never paid. And if they were never paid, somebody accumulated that, that wealth, right? And that wealth was reinvested, right? And all of the vestiges of justifying that behavior also became part of the beliefs about that, like why that was okay. And most human societies have benefited from that wealth. In the case of, of what became the United States, you can think of unpaid slave labor for 234 years created a wealth um, that contributed to the infrastructure of our country without making enslaved people the beneficiaries of their own labor. Right? Let's remember, that's part of the dynamic of enslavement. So number one, the Holocaust trope expands what we learn about the African experience from the 7th through the 18th century. Trafficking slaves was, hands out, was officially not ended until 1808, right? And in the other uh, talk, I'm going to talk about how slavery, trafficking slaves from Africa ended in 1808, but how in the U.S. we adapted what we call a two-system, right? Where we move slaves from the north to the south, right? Okay, we're going to talk about that. Number two. There was a better describes the impact of capture, enslavement, slavery, and colonialism. So when we study, we use this trope, Holocaust trope, we better understand those parts, right? They inform us about what was actually um, used to control people. And finally, clearly expose the levels and magnitudes of human rights abuses of these trafficked, those that were trafficked, those that were sold, and those that were brought, bought. I want to quickly, before I end, say something, since I taught a course on J.B. Grinnell, who also uh, is a distinguished uh, person, aspects of his life. But one of the things is, during his spring break, as a young 18-year-old, he was 18 and a half at the time, he went to D.C. and he saw a slave being sold, and he was he writes about it in his, have you read his autobiography? It's crazy. It's ridiculous in some ways. It's about this thick. <laughs> but, it, but one of the things, he takes time to describe how he was repulsed from the experience, right, of seeing this. And it was at that moment he made a decision that he wanted to live in a place where slavery didn't have its arms. And he also had a religious education, right? He was a minister. So his wife, who was the money holder, had land in Missouri and had land in Iowa, and you know the rest of the history, right? He's not a founder of the college, but he is a benefactor of the college. But what's really important is that there have always been people, that the Holocaust trope also shows us all the people that have been in resistance to Holocausts. And there were many that have been in resistance to the Black Holocaust. The final thing I want to say is, um, besides thank you, is I taught a course with my colleague back there, um, Will Freeman, and we taught a course on the American journeys. Is that not right? And one of the things that we reenacted, we were reenacting aspects of, of um, these journeys. And we walked from Rock Creek, Rock Creek at midnight with our students all, to, all the way to Grinnell, which would have been a historical moment. 
and our students had a chance to hear the dogs in the dark and do the very walk that actual people walk to get to Grinnell as one of the sites of the Underground Railroad. So resistance and the forms and the bravery of the people that were part of that are also what the Holocaust trough, trough allows us to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kay Show, for a lot of demonstration and a lot of understanding. And uh, we'll be back uh, next Wednesday, same time, same place, for a second of <coughs> Thank you very much. You Sorry folks are brave all the